<coughs> supported it, although the media and politicians saw it as a potential threat to press freedom. In Germany, churches soon started providing sanctuary for refugees on their premises, a medieval custom which no longer had any standing in law, but which the authorities continued to respect. At a memorial service attended by thousands after a terrorist attack in Copenhagen in Denmark in February, the message from both Lutheran church leaders and political leaders was that this did not express a fight between Islam and the West, and that terrorists and ordinary believers should not be confused. On the other side, there were church leaders who joined in and encouraged anti-Muslim voices. In October, Archbishop Antonio Canizares of Valencia warned against a future in which he saw Islam as a Trojan horse threatening the Spanish way of life. This was a theme which with the Moldovan Orthodox Church, which falls on the Moscow Patriarch, regularly emphasized during the year. In Greece, groups of Orthodox students demonstrated against plans to open a Department of Islamic Studies at the University of Thessaloniki while a number of metropolitans of the Greek Orthodox Church expressed their opposition to plans for a mosque in Athens. They saw the increasing public visibility of Islam as a return of the Ottomans. The debates and activities that reached a crescendo in the context of the refugee crisis have continued. The tensions were kept alive by further terrorist incidents through 2016. On 22 March, Terrorists struck at Brussels airport and at a metro station in the city, killing 35 and wounding over twice as many. On Bastille Day, 14 July, a heavy truck was driven along the Nice promenade in France, killing 86 people and wounding nearly 500. Just over a month later, a priest was murdered in a village in northern France. A bur in Berlin, a stolen truck was driven into a crowd at a Christmas market, killing 12. On 22 March 2017, his car was driven into people walking across Westminster Bridge in London, killing six. At the beginning of April, 15 people were killed by a suicide bomber on the St. Petersburg metro in Russia. Church leaders continued to take public stances on the event. During the spring of 2016, the Catholic Archbishop of Cologne, Rainer Maria Wölki, was interviewed in the Vatican by the Catholic broadcaster Dom Radio. He attacked the increase in anti-Muslim statements of the Party Alternative für Deutschland, uh, AFD, saying, the self-appointed saviors of the Christian West who are looking for an absolute antichrist should look in the mirror. In a video at the same time, he said, anyone who denigrates Muslims as their AFD leadership does should realize prayer rooms and mosques are equally protected by our constitution as our churches and chapels. Whoever says yes to church towers must also say yes to minarets. In August, a slightly more hesitant statement came from Cardinal Reinhard Marx, Archbishop of Munich and chair of the German Catholic Bishops Conference. He basically supported the idea of restricting refugee numbers, but called for humane treatment of those who were admitted. After the truck attack at a Christmas market in Berlin, the Lutheran priest at the Frederiksberg Palace Church in the Danish capital said to state radio that it's no use getting angry. There's no point in blaming lots of asylum seekers who have, after all, fled the horror of wars <clears throat> to places like Germany for this kind of thing. <clears throat> Sorry. Don't react with fear, he said, <clears throat> but face each other with love. In April 2017, the Protestant Berlin Bishop Markus Dröge called for continuing and strengthening the dialogue with Muslims who wish, to <laughs> who wish to dialogue. There have been continuing tensions between some local church leaders and the attitude of Pope Francis. So when the Bishop of Pisto in March 2016 told praise priests not to let Muslims pray in churches, it attracted public attention that two of his priests defied him with reference to the practice and call of the Pope. The refugees from the Middle East, especially Syria, but also Iraq, were not all Muslims, although one might think so if one depended on mainstream media headlines. 
Syria traditionally had a Christian minority of somewhere around 10%. And in Iraq, the activities of the so-called Islamic State had been focused in the Northwest, a region with a particularly large Christian minority. There were consequently many Christians among the refugees. At a time when Hungary was leading Eastern European opposition to the EU's attempts to spread the refugee burden, Prime Minister Viktor Orban had suggested that his country might help taking refugees, but not Muslims, a suggestion that was turned down by the European Commission as discriminatory. However, internal tensions among Muslims and Christian refugees themselves were becoming public, especially in Germany with its many refugees and refugee centers. By the summer of 2016, reports were emerging of Christians in the refugee shelters being harassed in various ways, some reports suggesting that as many as 80% of Christians had had such experiences. The chairman of Open Doors Germany, Markus Rode, talked of an atmosphere of fear and panic. In response, the Catholic Bishops' Conference said that its survey had indicated there was a problem that needed to be taken seriously, but that it was not common, a view backed up by the Protestant Bishop of Berlin. It's in the nature of this inquiry that when we ask ourselves what the Church's responses to the refugee crisis might be, we find ourselves heading towards the steps and actions church agencies and be accessible to the church and as such they speak for christians but the question has to be asked to what extent do their actions and statements represent the views of their congregations in reading their statements can we also read the views of their congregations if one ventures to answer yes it has to be with significant hesitations and qualifications perhaps such states statements are not actually intended to represent the views of the women and men in the church benches, rather to represent the considered theological view of the leadership in an effort to and importantly to educate as also the Lebanese civil war 1975-90 it was not unusual for church leaders, certainly at the level of parish priests, to engage in activities and to make statements which most observers would consider to be contradictory to central tenets of faith, making a mockery of, for example, the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. It's not, therefore not surprising that identification with their community might take precedence over loyalty to abstract principles. In so far as religious leaders and members of their community, it is to be expected that in circumstances where religion becomes ethnic or tribal, religious leaders can conceivably follow. This should be a prescription for pessimism in the present. But if we remind ourselves where we were just a few generations ago, there is, in my view, a strong case for optimism. When we look at the history of relations between Islam and Christianity, it's not a very cheerful story. This is not the place to exercise the history in any detail, but we can just remind ourselves of the conflicts which have taken place between Christian and Muslim powers over the centuries, with the, Christian, with the Crusades and Turks at the gates of Vienna holding iconic places. Our theological histories have given many more times space to willfully ignorant and condemnatory judgments than to attempt genuinely to understand each other. Granted, there have been times and places where interaction has been more constructive, certain periods in Islamic Spain or under the Ottomans, Elizabethan attempts to establish alliances between England and Morocco and Istanbul, and surprisingly, late 18th and 19th century fascination with Islam in Germanic art and literature. But these flashes of light have not been able to derail an accumulative narrative of mistrust and enmity. Given that history, it is, frankly, remarkable that relations in the present are not worse. The series of terrorist attacks in France since 2015 have been exploited by the Front National to boost support, and warnings against Muslims, domestic and foreign, became a central place in Marine Le Pen's campaign to become French president. 
although her vote in the final round in May 2017 was 50% higher than her father had achieved in the presidential election in 2002, she was still overwhelmed by her more liberal opponent, opponent, Emmanuel Macron. Despite all the noises around him, Gerd Wilder's share in the Dutch parliamentary vote in March 2017, although increased, was still only 13.3%. Understandably, the media paid an enormous amount of attention to the dramatic progress in 2017 of the anti-Islamic AFD in mostly former East Germany, which was attributed to opposition to Angela Merkel's open refugee policy over the previous years. Much less attention was given to the marked majority in favor of the refugee policy in the state of Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany. More specifically, we have seen how the churches generally throughout the crisis have taken a stand in favor of refugees and cooperation with Muslims and Islamic groupings. And this in spite of the growing public pressures from the nationalist right, which over recent years has dragged the political center generally in a rightward direction. I would argue that what we're seeing are the positive effects of decades of international, European, national, and local moves to nurture positive relations with Muslims and Islam, and to encourage a more constructive mutual engagement ranging across the spectrum from the theological to the practical. Those of us who have been engaged in Christian Muslim relations off and on over the years are often asked, what have we achieved? It's sometimes easy for us, especially in recent years, to be tempted by pessimism, even despair. But if we stand back a bit and look at a wider and deeper horizon, I believe that the story is encouraging. The fact that we are still meeting, talking, and working together in the face of the pressures around us today, I would suggest is a historical breakthrough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um, and it's lovely to be able to participate and to see old colleagues again. Um, very similar to my old friend, Jürgen Nielsen, my presentation on a, a rather difficult topic of Islam emphasis on caution, cautiously optimistic. Uh, so uh, the topic of Islam and democracy and whether they're compatible is um, a topic which has been discussed for well over a decade, a decade and a half. And for a concept whose time is supposedly come, it's masked a, a series of unanswered questions. And in the Muslim world, remarkable amount of heat. Is it a culturally specific term? 
reflecting Western European experience over several centuries. Does its emergence require the preset stages of economic development? Do Western societies possess their own standard participation? And accountability. Uh, Robert, as long ago as the 1950s, said that what has developed in the West is not democracy, but what he called polyarchy. It's an important idea. That is a shifting around of the chairs of the elite. It's neither a, a democracy in a pure sense, nor a dictatorship. It's a system of formal, but not substantive representative government. Free elections are allowed, but the choice is between competing elites only. And although everyone can vote, the formal consent given in voting may reinforce the inequalities of the system. So the idea, as we shall see, is unattainable. So what I will be talking about is a kind of proximate democracy to varying degrees, representative, participatory, and pluralist, but not popular in the sense that people have final power over the elites. Now, in the case of the Muslim world, this question of Islam and democracy, or this question of democracy, has been caught up with larger debates over whether Islam constitutes a threat to the West, which in turn has become acutely politicized. It's been caught up in the related controversies of Orientalism, the exceptionalism of Muslim societies, and the modernism of Islamist movements. Given that this is a huge subject, I'll limit myself to four points. One, there is no set theology on the issue of whether Islam is or can be democratic. Two, it is in any case, not simply a question of theology. Other factors have also been important. Three, nevertheless, normative shifts have occurred over time, in part because of the changing social circumstances. And institutional actors, such as civil society organizations, have both been inspired by these normative shifts and advanced their adoption and localization. Fourth, these institutional actors are, however, fragile. But at the same time, the evolution over time and gradually of a participatory and pluralist political culture, whether that is called democracy or not, can serve as an important counterweight to the ever-present possibility of autocracy, whether secular or religious. Let me take each in turn. First, despite what the specific proponents say, there is no simple theology on whether Islam and democracy are compatible. There is neither universal agreement nor a fixed, unchanging position. For the sake of convenience, there are several schools of thought. One which is heard in some quarters of the Muslim world is democracy with its emphasis on equality and constitutionalism, deviates from the perfection and the completion, completion of the Sharia, and is therefore antithetical to the faith. The Iranian cleric at the beginning of the 20th century, Fatal Nouri, was one such proponent so to say it could to, so to the Algerian Ali Belhaj. In the West, there is also the argument of incompatibility, but these argue from a reading of Muslim history summarized by not what was present, but what was absent. Indeed, in Leonard Binder's very evocative phrase, a cluster of absences the absence of a political culture of compromise and citizenship, the absence of an independent bourgeoisie 
and capitalist development as occurred in the West. The absence of intermediary institutions, such as professional guilds and associations that make the emergence of civil society difficult, if not also impossible. There's also an opposite school of thought that argues that Islam is not only compatible with democracy, but it is in essence democratic. Indigenous notions such as shura, ijtihad, ijma, in the rule of law, are in this view thought to be the equivalent of modern democratic norms. Muhammad Assad is a proponent. The Pakistani Kurshid Ahmed said this most succinctly. Islam and democracy, quote, are not two, are two sides of the same coin. And yet there's another school of thought that and theo-democracy. Other proponents are Ali Izabetovich in Bosnia, Abdul Karim Sorush in Iran. In this view, Islam maintains a centeredness on God rather than a God-life democracy. And while allowing for forms of participation and pluralism, does so within a spiritual, if not also a Sharia-minded framework. In short, as is apparent in all religions, scriptural truth is a matter of interpretation. And in this case, interpreters have presented a variety of positions. Second, although social scientific studies of democracy do not agree on a simple recipe, most have pointed to the need for social and economic development of some kind. The emergence of a strong middle class, increasing wealth, and the state's retrenched streets, vocation of authority, whereby the self-ascribed monopoly of the religious class to control the basic text has been shattered. Many now find texts, whether religious or political, directly accessible. The effect in the short term may well be a tightening of control in which the ulama and the government find common cause in keeping such alternative interpreters as Islamic groups at bay. But this fragmentation of authority has created a kind of de facto democratization of Islam, providing openings and giving voice to many for good or evil. Third, as much as some would object or even resent it, ideas that gain traction first in the West have become adopted in Muslim societies. This is largely the result of education, travel, and the media. And ideas and norms that would have been seen as alien, or at least appeared more pronounced in the West, have been indigenized and become their own. Admittedly, this process affects elites and intellectuals first. But when routinized, it can spread through wider society. We can see the trajectory clearly from the 19th century onwards into the 20th century with the Tanzimat in the Ottoman Empire, the Constitutional Revolution in Iran, and the journal Al-Manar. Today, today, we need only consider the universal rhetorical deference to the cause of human rights as an example of an increasingly salient norm. But as social conditions provided the means for the diffusion of ideas, their acceptability has come, come down to agents. Indonesia provides a good example, leaving aside the differences of leadership, membership, and political competition, Muhammadiyah and Nadlatul Ulama institutionalized the normative changes 
each in its own way. The fact that civil society organizations in Indonesia or the Middle East overlap with ascriptive identities, such as families, ethnic kinship, or specific religious sects, has not made them irrelevant or regressive. The appeal of these groups and their ability to reinvent themselves as development and culture change proceed is a powerful instrument for the localization of norms. Fourth and finally, what I've argued so far is to take political culture seriously, but not to overstate it. Social structures are important, but the example of the Trump era should dispel any This was the prophet Stephen's fallacy. Of he meant that we have mistakenly assumed that what occurred in the United States and Europe needs to occur in the Muslim world for democracy to take hold. Without entering into the debate over Islam Nusantara, there is clearly logic in the notion that local conditions affect the trajectory of Islam's manifestation and Islam's presence. But as the rise of white supremacy and new fascist groups in the Western democracy suggests, freedom of speech and association carries risks. And as we so often heard after the attack on the Capitol in Washington of January this year, democracy is fragile. There is no doubt that the rise of autocratic regimes is an ever-present possibility, even if they come to power via elections and in the form of populism, such as in Hungary. In the Middle East, the promise of the Arab Spring has disappeared. In the Muslim world, more generally, radical Islamic groups, Islamist groups, such as the Taliban or ISIS, present authoritarian alternatives. But as we also saw in January, the broad condemnation of the Washington, which was voiced by political institutions, civil society organizations, and the media alike, provided a critical stabilizing counterforce. The case of Indonesia suggests that the evolution of Muslim political actors who are rooted locally, but influenced by cosmopolitan trends and changing socioeconomic circumstances, and by the legacy of the state-sponsored ideology of religion-friendly nationalism. These Muslim actors, affected by these contextualized factors, have provided a counterweight to more radical alternatives over time. The challenge for the future is how to maintain the civic values of tolerance and openness in the process. So in sum, Islam needs to be understood as a complex of evolving political ideas and social relations. Islam and democracy are not mutually exclusive concepts, nor is it inevitable that they automatically coexist. The answer to the question, are they compatible, lies in historical rather. So I want to thank I wish you all the best, and I'm sure that you will have very rich discussions to follow. Thank you.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بداية أتوجه بالشكر للجنة المنظمة على تنظيم هذه الندوة العالمية الخاصة بالحضارة الإسلامية والتي تعتبر حقيقة فرصة أكاديمية ثرية للتلاقح الفكري وإثراء مجالات البحث والتدارس في الفكر الإسلامي والنهوض به الموضوع الذي سوف أتحدث عنه اليوم هو موضوع إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي وأسبابه المفهومية إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي وأسبابه المفهومية سوف أتناول هذا الموضوع من خلال مجموعة من العناصر أولا إشكال المفهومية عفوا إشكال الموضوعية ومدى ارتباطه بالمنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإسلامي ثانيا المداخل التي نستطيع من خلالها حل إشكال الموضوعية والإجابة عن أسئلته طبعا المداخل كثيرة هناك المدخل المفهومي المدخل التصوري والنظري ثم أخيرا المدخل العملي التطبيقي لكنني سوف أكتفي فقط بالمدخل في هذه الورقة بالمدخل المفهومي لحل إشكال الموضوعية من خلال المدخل المفهومي سوف أدرس دلالات المنهجية والمذهبية وكيف تؤثر في الوصل والفصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإسلامي وكيف يؤثر ذلك في الإجابة عن سؤال أو إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي بعد دراسة دلالات المنهجية والمذهبية سوف أستخلص وأستخرج مؤشرات من خلالها يمكن أن نحدد مواضع الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية عموما وبين المنهج والمذهب بشكل خاص هذه المؤشرات سوف تنحصر في أربعة مؤشرات المؤشر الأول هو مؤشر الوسيلة الثاني هو مؤشر الغاية الثالث هو مؤشر المنظومة والرابع هو مؤشر المجال يعني وسائل المنهج ووسائل المذهب غاية المنهج وغاية المذهب المنظومة التي ينتمي إليها المنهج والمنظومة التي ينتمي إليها المذهب ومجال المنهج ومجال المذهب ثم في الأخير سوف أختم بآفاق الدراسة والبحث في إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي بداية حين نتحدث عن إشكال الموضوعية فمعلوم أن من أبرز وأكبر الصعوبات التي تعترض طريق التقييم الموضوعي لكل إنتاج فكري عموما والإنتاج الفكري داخل الفكر الإسلامي بشكل خاص هي صعوبة تحديد مواضع الفصل والوصل أي الاتفاق والاختلاف الالتقاء والافتراق بين المنهجية والمذهبية تزداد هذه الصعوبة استفحالا وإشكالا بسبب غياب معايير صارمة نستطيع من خلالها أن نميز الالتزام المنهجي عن الانتماء المذهبي لماذا تغيب هذه المعايير الصارمة؟ لأسباب كثيرة أذكر منها سببين اثنين السبب الأول هو تداخل المنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإنساني بشكل عام وفي الفكر الإسلامي بشكل خاص ثانيا تعدد معاني المنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإسلامي بسبب تعدد معاني المنهج ومعاني المذهب كيف يمكننا إذا أن نحل إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي للإجابة عن سؤال الموضوعية ومعالجة إشكالات الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية يمكن أن نعتمد على ثلاثة مداخل المدخل الأول هو الإشكال التصوري المفهومي وهو الذي سوف تقتصر عليه هذه الدراسة أو هذه الورقة المدخل الثاني هو الإشكال النظري التجريدي والمدخل الثالث هو الإشكال العملي التطبيقي ومعلوم طبعا أن كل واحد من هذه المستويات مبني على المستوى الذي قبله فإذا قمنا بحل الإشكال المفهومي يسهل بعد ذلك حل الإشكال النظري ويسهل أخيرا حل الإشكال العملي التطبيقي وبناء والبناء عليه
كما قلت سوف اقتصر كما قلت سوف اقتصر في هذه الورقه على الاشكال المفهومي والاشكال المفهومي ايضا له مستويات مختلفه ومداخل وادوات مختلفه يمكننا من خلالها ان ندرس المنهجيه والمذهبيه وندرس ايضا مواضع الفصل والوصل بينهم من بين هذه الادوات المستخدمه في المدخل المفهومي او المقاربه المفهوميه اولا مثلا على سبيل المثال دراسه الوصل والفصل بين المنهج والمذهبية نتيجة أو دراسة الألفاظ نتيجة الاختلاف الحاصل بينهما بسبب الترجمة كما نعلم أن مصطلح المذهب ومصطلح المنهج استخدم في اللغة العربية باستخداماتها الأصلية وأيضا دخلت عليهم بعض المعاني والمفاهيم بسبب ترجمة مصطلح method أو methodology وأيضا المذهب يعني ترجمة إما من دكترين أو ايديولوجي أو غيرها من الأصول الأجنبية الوسيلة الثانية أيضا التي يمكن أن نستخدم هي دراسة اللفظين بحسب موقعهما من الشبكة المفهومية إذا كما نعلم أن كل مجموعة من المصطلحات ومجموعة من المفاهيم تشترك في شبكة مفهومية تنتمي إليها يمكننا أيضا أن ندرس المنهجية والمذهبية والمنهج والمذهب من خلال هذا المدخل لكن المدخل الذي سوف أعتمده أنا هو المدخل الذي يمكن أن نسميه والمستوى الاصطلاحي إلى أي درجة يمثل المنهج والمذهب مصطلحا إذا مدخل الدراسة المفهومية تدرس يعني من خلال المستوى الاصطلاحي تدرس قوة اللفظ أي قوته الاصطلاحية هل هو لفظ مجرد لفظ لغوي أم يرقى إلى مستوى المفهوم أم يرقى إلى أعلى مقام لغوي وهو مقام المصطلح وكما نعلم أن المصطلح يكون أكثر دقة الخصائص التي من خلالها يمكن أن نعرف هل هذه الكلمة هي مجرد لفظ أو ترتقي إلى مستوى مفهوم أو ترتقي إلى أعلى درجة لغوية وهي مستوى المصطلح يكون من خلال خصيصتين الخصيصة الأولى هي خصيصة الاتفاق والثانية هي خصيصة النضج هل هذا اللفظ ناضج لغويا وهل هذا اللفظ متفق على معناه وعلى دلالته إذا فكما قلت فالعنصر المحدد لقوة الاصطلاح هو حظ اللفظ من خصيصتي الاتفاق والنضج. إذا كان اللفظ كأي كلمة في اللغة العربية كانت كاملة النضج متفقا على دلالتها فإن قوتها تزداد وتتحول إلى مصطلح. لكن إذا كان النضج اللفظي خفيفا وغير متفق على دلالته فطبعا هنا تضعف قوته ويتحول إلى مفهوم. وهذا الإشكال الذي سوف نرى حين سوف نتحدث عن المنهجية والمذهبية بشكل عام أو عن المنهج لفظ المنهج ولفظ المذهب. حيث سوف نلاحظ أن خصيصة الاتفاق طبعا هناك كما قلت خصيصة الاتفاق والنضج لكن أنا سوف أركز في هذه الورقة على خصيصة الاتفاق فقط لأن تناول النقطتين معا سوف يعني المداخلة إذا فقلت إذا درسنا لفظ المنهج والمذهب من خلال مؤشر أو خصيصة الاتفاق سوف يتضح لنا أن كلمة المنهج لم تحضر فيها خصيصة الاتفاق حضورا تاما إذا فهناك تعريفات مختلفة للمنهج وليس هناك اتفاق على معنى واحد للمنهج يعني لكي أعطي مثال على هذا الاختلاف يعني حين نقول المنهج فطبعا له تعريفات متعددة لكن حين نقول مثلا مصطلح من المصطلحات كالقرآن الكريم أو السنة النبوية فبطبيعة الحال ينصرف الفهم إلى شيء واحد ومعين ومحدد نظرا لان لانه مصطلح اذا كما قلت فخصيصه الاتفاق لم تحضر في لفظة المنهج حضورا تاما وهذا حال دون رقيه الى مستوى المصطلح اذا فالمنهج يقع في حيز المفهوم أما المذهب فله استخدامات متعددة بعضها حظي بالاتفاق على معناه في مجالات معينة مثل المجال الفقهي أو مجال علم الكلام فحين نقول المذهب الفقهي فالمعنى واضح ويبقى إلى مستوى المصطلح حين نقول أيضا الألات أخرى يحظى بهذا المستوى من الدقة الاصطلاحية وبقي فقط في مستوى المفهوم
إذا النتيجة أننا أمام مفهوم المنهج بدلالاته المختلفة وأمام مصطلح المذهب في مجال الفقه ومجال علم الكلام وأيضا أمام مفهوم المذهب نأتي الآن إلى نماذج منتقات من تعريفات المنهج وتعريفات المذهب العلاقات بين هذه التعريفات العلاقات بين تعريفات المنهج العلاقات بين تعريفات المذهب وكيف أثرت هذه التعريفات المختلفة في تحديد مواضع الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإسلامي مما أثر على إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي إذا التعريفات طبعا تعريفات المنهج عديدة جدا لكن أقتصر على خمسة منها فقط مثال على هذه التعريفات أن المنهج خطة منظمة لعدة عمليات ذهنية أو حسية إذا هي خطة تنظم عمليات ذهنية وعمليات حسية أيضا بهدف الوصول إلى كشف الحقيقة أو البرهنة عليها ثانيا أن المنهج هو الطريق المؤدي إلى الكشف عن الحقيقة في العلوم بواسطة طائفة من القواعد العامة تهيمن على سير العقل وتحدد عملياته حتى يصل إلى نتيجة معلومة ثالثا أن المنهج هو تقنية عمل في هذا الحقل أو ذاك من حقوق المعرفة البرية للكشف عن حقيقة ما أو مقاربتها تحليلا وتركيبا رابعا أن المنهج هو طرق البحث وإجراءاته في مجال معرفي خامسا أن المنهج هو مفردات وأدوات ووسائل وقواعد وخطوات وإجراءات هي مكونات المنهجية إذا كما لاحظتم معي في هذه التعريفات فهناك عناصر ومكونات متعددة موجودة في كل تعريف منها مثلا التعريفات الأولى يعني بعضها ذكر الوسيلة الوسائل التي يستخدمها المنهج بعضها ذكر الغايات أو الأهداف التي يريد أن يصل إليها المنهج بعضها حدد لنا مكانة المنهج وموضعه ضمن منظومة عامة هي منظومة المنهجية وتعرف المنهجية على أنها علم المناهج أيضا تنوعت الوسائل المرتبطة بالمنهج بعضها قواعد بعضها تقنيات بعضها إجراءات أيضا أدوات وسائل خطوات بعض هذه الوسائل تعتمد على العقل بعضها يستعين بالحس أيضا الغاية من المنهج تنوعت وتعددت واختلفت بين هذه التعريفات بعضها يذكر أن غاية المنهج هي الكشف عن الحقيقة والبعض الآخر يقول أنها مقاربة الحقيقة وليس الكشف عنها وبعضها يجعل غاية المنهج هو البرهن على الحقيقة والاستدلال عليها نأتي الآن إلى تعريفات المذهب ونرصد الاختلافات الموجودة بينها بحسب المؤشرات الغاية والوسيلة والمنظومة والمجال مثال على هذه التعريفات أن المذهب هو الطريقة والمعتقد التي الذي تذهب إليه يذهب إليه أي شخص من الأشخاص أن ثانيا أن المذهب هو مجموعة من المبادئ والآراء المتصلة والمنسقة لمفكر معين أو لمدرسة معينة تعريف ثالث أنه مجموعة من النظريات أو الآراء النظرية والعلمية في مجال من مجالات الفكر والحياة تكون في الغالب مترابطة ومتسقة فيما بينها ولها ممثلون يقولون بصوابها ويعملون على نشرها بين الآخرين وعلى الدفاع عنها إذا نلاحظ هنا مرة أخرى أن هناك تنوعا واختلافا بين تعريفات المذهب والمؤشرات التي يستخدمها كل واحد من هذه التعريفات إذا إجمالا يمكن أن نقول أن التعريفات المذكورة للمذهب تتضمن ثلاثة عناصر العنصر الأول مختلف فيه يعني ما هو هذا المذهب البعض يعتبره أنه معتقد البعض يعتبره أنه مجموعة من المبادئ والآراء البعض الآخر يعتقد أنه مجموعة من النظريات والآراء النظرية والعلمية العنصر الثاني الذي لاحظناه أنه موجود في هذه التعريفات 
يصف لنا طبيعة العنصر الأول إذا كان العنصر الأول معتقد مجموعة من الآراء مجموعة من النظريات فالعنصر الثاني يصف لنا هذه المعتقدات وهذه الآراء وهذه النظريات ويعتبرها مثلا يصفها بأنها متصلة متصقة منسقة مترابطة إلى غير ذلك من الأوصاف العنصر الثالث يحدد لنا الجهة الحاملة للمعتقد أو الرأي أو النظرية ويذكر لنا أنها إما مفكر أو مدرسة أو ممثلون لهذا المذهب أو الاتجاه إذا من خلال هذه المعاني المختلفة والعناصر المكونة لكل واحد منها في تعريفات المنهج والمذهب كيف أثرت هذه الاختلافات في الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية من أجل الإجابة عن إشكال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي إذا يمكننا هنا كما قلت أن نستخدم أربعة مؤشرات الاختلاف بين المنهجية والمذهبية وفق مؤشر الوسيلة أي الوسائل المستخدمة ما هي الوسائل التي يستخدمها المنهج والوسائل التي يستخدمها المذهب الاختلاف وفق مؤشر الغاية أي الأهداف التي يريد أن يصل إليها المنهج والأهداف التي يريد أن يصل إليها المذهب الاختلاف وفق مؤشر المنظومة المنظومة التي ينتمي إليها المنهج والمنظومة التي ينتمي إليها المذهب ثم الاختلاف حسب مؤشر المجال أي المجالات التي يشتغل في إطارها المنهج ويشتغل في إطارها المذهب إذا نأتي إلى مؤشر الوسيلة كما لاحظنا من خلال التعريفات السابقة أن مناهج عفوا أن وسائل المنهج تتمثل في خطة أو قواعد أو تقنية أو إجراءات أو أدوات أو خطوات وهذه المكونات توحي لنا بأن المنهج متجرد عن التحيزات وعن أحكام القيمة إذا تطابعه غير متحيز وغير متأثر بأحكام القيمة لأنه مجرد أدوات وإجراءات وخطوات وقواعد تقنية وسائل المذهب هنا تتنوع إلى نوعين هي إما عبارة عن استنباط واستدلال والاستنباط والاستدلال طبعا هو أبعد ما يكون عن التحيز لأنه يقترب إلى المنهج حين نقول استدلال واستنباط فهو أداة من الأدوات المنهجية أو هو عبارة عن مجموعة من المبادئ والآراء والنظريات والآراء العلمية وهنا طبعا يكون متحيزا لأنه يعكس ويعبر عن مواقف أصحابه وخلفياتهم الفلسفية وقبلياتهم المعرفية وفق هذا المؤشر مؤشر الوسيلة الوسائل التي يستخدمها المنهج والوسائل التي يستخدمها المذهب ما هي مواضع الفصل والوصل بينهما مواضع الفصل أين يتميز تتميز المنهجية عن المذهبية الفصل يتمثل في أن المنهج ذو طابع صوري وظيفي محايد لا يتحيز وهذا بخلاف المذهب لكن ما هي مواضع الوصل وأين يلتقيان أين يلتقي المنهج بالمذهب يلتقيان في أن أولا المذهب لابد أن يستند إلى منهج من أجل أن يبرهن على نتائجه وأن يقنعنا بها لا يمكن لأي مذهب من المذاهب أن يتكلم جزافا واعتباطا دون أن يستخدم أدوات منهجية من أجل أن يبرهن على آرائه ويقنع المستمعين بها الموضع الثاني من مواضع الوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية يتمثل في أن المذهب يمثل ما قبل المنهج وما بعد المنهج ما معنى ذلك؟ المذهب يمثل ما قبل المنهج أي أحيانا يمثل الأصول النظرية التي ينطلق منها الباحث والمفكر الإسلامي من أجل أن يصل إلى نتيجة معينة إذا ينطلق من أصول نظرية ثم يستخدم المنهج من أجل الوصول إلى هدف محدد وقد يمثل المذهب ما بعد المنهج أي بعد أن يستخدم المفكر الإسلامي منهجا معينا فإنه يصل إلى نتيجة مذهبية معينة إذا هذه هي مواضع الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإسلامي وفق مؤشر 
الوسيلة أي الوسائل التي يستخدمها المنهج والوسائل التي يستخدمها المذهب ننتقل إلى المؤشر الثاني وهو مؤشر الغاية ما هي مواضع الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية يعني أين يلتقيان وأين يفترقان حسب مؤشر الغاية أي الهدف الذي يريد كل واحد منهما أن يصل إليه مواضع الفصل والافتراق والاختلاف تتمثل في نقطتين أول أبدا هو الوصول إلى الحقيقة إما الوصول إليها أو مقاربتها أو الاستدلال عليها أو البرهنة عليها أما المذهب فبخلافه يتسم بالذاتية يعني فيها يوجد فيه السبجكتيفيتي يعني لا يتميز بنفس الدقة الموضوعية والحيادية الموجودة للمنهج لأن المذهب أيا كان هذا المذهب حتى ولو كان مذهبا بمعناها الإصطلاحي يعني مذهبا فقهيا أو مذهبا كلاميا بعيدا عن الإيديولوجيا فإن المذهب دائما يدافع عن نفسه ويهدف إلى الإقناع بمنطلقاته الفكرية من أجل تحقيق الانتشار الواسع هذا هو مواضع الفصل بين المنهجيه والمذهبيه حسب مؤشر الغايه، لكن اين يلتقيان؟ اين يلتقي المنهج بالمذهب في ما يخص مؤشر الغايه؟ اولا غايه المنهج وغايه المذهب الفقهي هي الكشف عن حقيقه معينه ومقاربتها، يعني حتى المذهب الفقهي المفكر الاسلامي الذي يشتغل في المذاهب الفقهيه فهو بالنسبه له ما يدافع عنه يعتبر حقيقة يريد أن يصل إليها وأن يقاربها الوصل أيضا يتمثل في أن غاية المنهج وغاية المذهب بمعناها المفهومي وليس بمعناها الإصطلاحي تتمثل في البرهنة على الحقيقة أو ما يراه صاحب المذهب أنه حقيقة ننتقل الآن إلى مؤشر ثالث إذن بعد أن تحدثنا عن مؤشر الوسيلة ومؤشر الغاية نتحدث عن مؤشر المنظومة والنسق الذي ينتمي إليه كل من المنهج والمذهب من خلال التعريفات السابقة التي رأينا يتبين لنا أن المذهب له منظومة واحدة وهي المنظومة الداخلية في حين أن المنهج له منظومتان منظومة داخلية ثم منظومة خارجية أكبر منه ينتمي إليها المنظومة الداخلية للمذهب تتمثل في مكوناته وعناصره التي تتسم وتتميز بالاتصال والترابط والتنسيق والاتصاق إذن فالمذهب هو منظومة داخلية مغلقة تحاول أن تحقق الاتصال والترابط والتنسيق والاتصاق بين مكوناتها أما المنهج ف هو ينتمي إلى منظومتين هناك منظومة داخلية للمنهج تتمثل في يعني اعتبار أن المنهج تنظيم وبناء يشمل ويضم ويتضمن على مجموعة من المكونات الفرعية إذن وبناء فيه مكونات فرعية تمثل منظومته الداخلية وهي الأدوات والقواعد والتقنيات والإجراءات وغيرها من الوسائل التي يستخدمها ولكن إضافة إلى هذه المنظومة الداخلية فالمنهج ينتمي إلى منظومة خارجية وهي منظومة المنهاجية أو علم المناهج والتي من خلالها ينتظم المنهج في إطارها ويشكل ويمثل أحد عناصرها الأساسية إذا فوفق مؤشر المنظومة نقول أن المنهج له منظومة داخلية وخارجية في حين أن المذهب له منظومة داخلية فقط ما هي مواضع الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية في الفكر الإسلامي وفق مؤشر المنظومة؟ إذا مواضع الفصل بينهما والتمايز بينهما والاختلاف والافتراق يتميز أولا يتميز المذهب عفوا المنهج عن المذهب بانتمائه إلى منظومة خارجية أكبر كما قلنا المذهب له منظومة داخلية فقط في حين أن المنهج ينتمي إلى منظومة خارجية أكبر وهي منظومة المنهجية ثانيا حين ينتظم المنهج ضمن منظومة سواء منظومته الداخلية أو المنظومة الخارجية المتمثلة في المنهجية فإن هذا يوفر له ضمانات لكي يكون سليما يعني يكون المنهج أقرب إلى السلامة وإلى الصواب في حين أن المذهب حتى لو انتظمت مكوناته ضمن منظومتها الداخلية أي الآراء والمبادئ والنظريات فإن هذا لا يضمن له الصواب ولا يضمن له أنه سيصل إلى الحقيقة جيو المذهبية وفق مؤشر المنظومة
ما هي مواضع الوصل بينهما؟ أين يلتقيان؟ يلتقيان في أن المذهب يحتاج إلى منهج ويحتاج إليه مرتين المرة يحتاج إليه في المرة الأولى لأن المنهج يمثل قاعدة صلبة يمكن أن يستند إليها المذهب ويبني عليها نتائجه لذلك كما نرى مثلا في المذاهب الفقهية أو المذاهب الكلامية فإن صاحب المذهب يعني الفقيه أو المتكلم يستخدم من لكي تشكل له قاعدة صلبة يبني عليها بعد ذلك نتائجه وآراءه فهذا هو الوجه الأول من احتياج المذهب إلى منهج الوجه الثاني هو أن المنهج يعني المذهب يحتاج إلى المنهج لأن المنهج ينتمي إلى منظومة أكبر وهي منظومة المنهجية وهذه المنظومة هي التي تضمن تصحيح مسار المنهج بشكل مستمر وتضمن من ثم التزام الفقيه والتزام المتكلم والتزام صاحب المذهب بشكل عام ما أمكن بالمحددات والمؤطرات المنهجية التي تكفر له الموضوعية نأتي إلى آخر مؤشر وهو مؤشر المجال المجال الذي يشتغل فيه المنهج والمجال الذي يشتغل فيه المذهب من خلال المصطلحات والمفاهيم التي درسناها المعاني الاصطلاحية والمفهومية التي درسناها للمنهج والمذهب يتبين أن مفهوم المنهج مرتبط بشكل عام بالعقل والعلوم طبعا هذا لا ينفي ارتباطه بأشياء أخرى لكن كما قلت فأنا أتحدث عن هذه المؤشرات انطلاقا من التعريفات التي قدمنا أمثلة منها وإلا فإذا وسعنا الدائرة واشتغلنا بتعريفات أكثر فمن ال مؤكد أننا سوف نصل إلى مؤشرات أكثر وإلى عناصر ضمن المؤشرات أكثر من هذا الذي وصلنا إليه إذا كما قلت وفق مؤشر المجال فيتبين لنا أن مفهوم المنهج مرتبط بالعقل والعلوم كما قلت بناء على التعريفات التي رأيناها سابقا مصطلح المذهب مرتبط بعلمي الكلام والفقه مفهوم المذهب منفتح على سائر مجالات الفكر والحياة إذا نلاحظ أن هناك ثلاث مجالات مختلفة مجال العقل والعلوم فيما يخص مفهوم المنهج مجال علم الكلام وعلم الفقه فيما يخص مصطلح المذهب ثم سائر مجالات الفكر والحياة فيما يخص مفهوم المذهب ما هي مواضع ومواطن الفصل والوصل بين المنهجية والمذهبية وفق مؤشر المجال مواضع الوصل والاتفاق والتلاقي حين يستوعب مجال المنهج مجال المذهب ومتى يستوعبه يعني حين يستوعب مجال المنهج مجال المذهب يستوعبه حين يكون المنهج مرتبط بالعلوم والعقل ويكون المذهب دالا على معنى المذهب الفقهي او الكلامي فهنا يكون المنهج مجال المنهج عفوا مستوعبا لمجال المذهب في هذه الحالة يقوم المنهج بتأطير المذهب ويحتكم الى المنهج في تقييم المذهب وتقويمه مواضع الفصل بين المنهج والمنهجية والمذهبية حين نتحدث عن المنهج عفوا المذهب بمعناها المفهومي الايديولوجي ففي هذه الحالة يكون المذهب في الغالب عاريا عن مظلة المنهجية ويكون بمثابة خلفيات فلسفية وقبليات معرفية لا سبيل إلى التحقق من مصداقيتها وصحتها وتكون متفلتة من الناحية المنهجية ويصعب تطبيق منهج محدد عليها ختاما آتي إلى آفاق الدراسة والبحث التي يمكن من خلالها أن تساعدنا على الإجابة الشافية والكافية والنهائية لسؤال الموضوعية في الفكر الإسلامي وكما قلت فإن الحل النهائي لإشكال الموضوعية سوف يبقى رهين حل إشكالات مختلفة بالأساس يمكن أن نلخصها في ثلاثة إشكالات الإشكال المفهومي وما يبنى عليه وهو الإشكال النظري ثم ثالثا الإشكالات العملية وكما رأيتم فقد تناولنا نحن فقط جانبا واحدا هو الإشكال المفهومي وتناولنا مدخلا من مداخله فقط وهو مدخل المستوى الإصطلاحي ومن خلال خصيصتين الاتفاق والنج ونحن تحدثنا فقط عن خصيصة النج نماذج من الإشكالات الموضوعية التي يمكن أن تشكل آفاق للدراسة والبحث 
مستقبلا من اجل حل اشكال الموضوعيه والاجابه عن سؤاله اولا ان هناك احكام قيمه تعتري المنهج والمذهب وهي احكام نسبيه وللاسف هذا يعرقل موضوع التقييم الموضوعي للاعمال التي تنتمي الى الفكر الاسلامي، اذا احكام القيمه التي تعتري المنهج والمذهب هي احكام نسبيه، نحكم على المنهج ونحكم على المذهب ونطلق عليهم احكاما نسبيه تحول دون التدقيق في مجال المنهجيه والمذهبيه والاجابه عن سؤال الموضوعي. ثانيا أن مفردات المنهج وأدواته وإجراءاته لا تحتفظ في مجالياتها لماذا؟ لأن أنا أعرف من في سنورة العلم أن العلم خطأ وملاءمة يعني نعم 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 أنت معنا؟ نعم ممكن تعجل شوية الوقت إلا ثلاثة دقائق البكي ممكن؟ أخلص خلصت باقي فقط فقر فقط نقطتان فقط اذا كما قلت فمفردات المنهج وخطواته وخطواته الاجرائيه لا تحتفظ بمعياريتها المطلقه لان العلم خطا وملاءم اذا فحين يصل العلم الى تقدم في مستوى معين يصبح ما كان منهجيا فيما قبل يصبح يخرج من حيز الموضوعيه الى حيز الذاتيه الاشكال الثالث ما قبل الاخير وهو أن الظاهرة الإنسانية يختلط فيها الذاتي بالموضوعي وكما نعرف فمجال الفكر الإسلامي هو مجال الشغال يعني يقوم به البشر يعني مفكر إسلامي هو بشر ويدرس قضايا إنسانية إذا فيكون الإنسان نفسه هو موضوع البحث وهو أداة البحث وهذا يشكل يعني عائقا كبيرا أمام الموضوعية آخر نقطة وهي أن كل ممارسة من الممارسات الفكرية التي يقوم بها الإنسان سواء كانت في مجال الفكر الإسلامي أو غيره فهي تخضع بالضرورة للقبليات المعرفية ونحن نعلم أن هناك إشكالات كثيرة تثيرها هذه القبليات مما يؤدي إلى صعوبة تقييمها ومعرفة مدى تأثيرها وشكرا لكم وأعتذر عن الإطالة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Lafo Shukran Shukran Yeah, can I share the screen first? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Salamar Sian, right? Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sudhiriza from Myanmar. Uh, today I would like to present about the peace and culture communication among inter-ethnic groups. Uh, and I want to focus on the case of Myanmar uh, peace building process and conflict resolution. Uh, so, uh let's move to my presentation um okay and um, okay first uh let's talk about the piece so what is peace uh actually it is hard to explain in detail and the Sometimes we think that peace is like a happiness and harmony in our lives. 
but sometimes we often recognize by its absence like love justice and freedom and so on so so that's why the some scholars like Johan Gatron and others have defined positive peace and negative peace and they describe peace uh, study in those definitions like so positive peace is the simultaneous presence of many desirable states of mind in society uh, so for example harmony justice and equity and so on it's like an integration of human society or uh, negative peace is like the absence of war and other forms of white scale violent human conflict in lives so uh, anyway we need uh, we need continuous peacekeeping and peacemaking in terms of peace and when we talk about the peace we need peacekeeping and peacemaking so in peacemaking uh, we we require at and continue passing and the quality transformation so always like um and so uh, in every sector, we know that we need good communication, a better communication in every sector. And also in peace building, we need communication, of course. So in conflict area, uh, communication have the important role uh, in stopping the view of policymaker influencing popular opinion in conflict. So however, uh, we have very limited understanding the uh, understanding about the role of communication that communication plays in the numerous trend of post-conflict reconstruction, including like the peace building, governance, and long-term development. And communication is also the recent phenomena in peace building process. So uh, many organizations nowadays are using communication as a tool for the uh, for their works in conflict prevention and peace building in you know in every sector like and so uh i want to focus on one of the communication style like cultural communication which is the main topic in to today's presentation so what is cultural communication is a very popular word in every sector of professionalism so because in every society we have culture differences and those culture differences can cause barriers to communication when interacting each other people around the world including us are uh, inter see intercept uh, inter and the evaluate behavior differently based on their different cultural backgrounds. And then cultural communication is always applied in the interaction process between the two cultures or different cultures. So it is also the hottest topics uh, and useful time in the multicultural society like as in Myanmar and in other countries uh, and with different culture and traditions. So it is about the cultural communication. So so uh, let's talk about the, the relation between cultural communication and peace, uh, what they are related. Like in multicultural societies, people focus and the respect to their culture inheritance and process. Culture is also the key factor in conflict resolution and peace process. So cultural identities are the main point in the system of resolving uh, long, deep rooted long conflicts. And we can also deny that cultural communication is shaped by the communicator from different cultural background and practices. So, those are the slight overview of cultural communication and peace in multicultural societies. So, so what is uh what's the saturation? I want to focus the uh, the cultural communication and peace saturation in Myanmar. So like uh, as everybody know that Myanmar is highly ethnically diverse with over one thirty five officially recognized ethnicities, and uh, in among the ethnicities, Burmese ethnic groups is the majority two third of the population. I'm also the Bam Burmese. I'm also from the Burmese ethnic group. And uh, during the British colonial time, ethnic regions were controlled, uh, separated from Central Burma. Central Burma is the, the region when the, uh, most of the Burmese, Burmese people have been residing for a long time. Uh, so so what are the, uh, where are the ethnic regions? Ethnic regions are the, you know, the borderland, uh, the borderland of the Myanmar with, you know, 
border with uh, many uh, neighboring countries like India, China, uh, Bangladesh, and Thailand. Those are the ethnic regions in Myanmar. So uh, the ethnic conflict have been breaking out since it independent in 1948. So it is a very long ethnic conflict. Uh, I have to say that ethnic diversity uh, tell you know, many stories, like in, especially in Myanmar, like uh, we have so many stories and so many such, and you know, the abstract story behind the ethnic diversity, like uh, the Myanmar demography is so complicated and so ethnic people separate into different regions, into the separate groups. So based on their groups and they are you know, custom belief idea, the tradition have been totally different. Uh, and uh, like also, uh, you know, other countries, they are even the, you know, Indonesia groups like I, I learned about that so one year before the independence national independent leaders promised for the ethnic rights after the independence especially for the self-administration in the ethnic regions but but uh, unfortunately those promises and agreement has remained as a paper up until now so the ethnic people you know have been angry about that up until now. So the government after the independent failed to implement ethnic rights. So we ha I have to say that that's why the ethnic people suffer a lot because of that, uh, you know, the, fa the failure to implement the ethnic rights by the government. And so so the governments of the of Myanmar throughout the time have been struggling for peace building and conflict resolution. So Myanmar ethnic conflict has uh, started since 1949 after the independence. So so many you know my, uh, many international friends ask me about the, what is the main reason about the, what is the main reason of ethnic conflict in Myanmar. So I have to say that it is uh, ethnic rights and freedom. So because, you know, uh, during the socialist regime around 1960s, it was the darkest time for the ethnic rights and freedom because, you know, uh, printers and publisher registration law 1962 and censor law 1965 point to the suppress on ethnic rights because those law broke the publication of ethnic languages and ethnic literatures in them in the country. So at the time there were no organization or institution for preserving and protecting ethnic languages. Oh, those are the uh, th uh, those are the significant suppression on the ethnic rights at the time. So there are many other you know suppression in many forms, but those are the significant ways. And then. So what and the people, ethnic people also, you know, suffering the trauma of harmonization concerning the suppression of ethnic rights and cultures. Uh, so what is a harmonization? It is like the, you know, majority Burmese ethnic groups dominate most of the opportunities in politics, uh, business, social, education, and even in workplace. Uh, so ethnic people believe, you know, started, starting to believe that federalism, federalism, the system of federalism for their equal rights. They think that only federalism in politics, political system can bring the equality for the ethnic people. So, but on the other hand, some Burmese people think that federalism is separation and they even think that uh, the federal, federalism, federal system in the country can lead Myanmar into separated regions with many, you know, uh, political ideas or something like that. So it started, you know, the differences and in political beliefs and then it started the uh, mutual, uh, it started misunderstanding. So, you know, even the, we have the very, uh, you know, uh, we have differences in political system. So, uh, but we trying to, our government trying to uh, pay the uh, peace, uh, 
peace building and the conflict resolution. Uh, so I have to say that after that, after 2010, uh, the, the democratic government, at the time it was the golden time for the peace, the government formed the six new sub-administrative regions uh, based on the new 2008 constitution. So the government also organized Myanmar Peace Center and also accelerated the negotiating process for peace building at the national level. So the, from that uh, point, um, Myanmar government and the eight major ethnic um, organization can sign the nationwide ceasefire agreement on 15 October 2015. And it also the most successful landmark for peace building in Myanmar history. But unfortunately, uh, it already been six years uh, in this uh, October, but um, the peace process, the total peace process is still pending and uh, there is no improvement at all uh, because the, there are so many reasons like uh, pandemic saturation and also that uh, some political you know, changes in Myanmar like that. And and also uh, we, you know, when we talk about the peace process, most of the people think that peace building with, you know, political solution, weapons, wars, and so on. But, you know, actually in, in multicultural, in some multicultural societies like Myanmar, the conflicts break out due to the lack of communication. Because, you know, culture is the main key in peace building process in multicultural diverse societies like Myanmar. So, or uh, we have to approach uh, from the new aspect like culture communication and peace building process. So, but actually, uh, culture communication is always forgotten in the practical peace building process and conflict resolution. Also in Myanmar, we the policy makers they always forgot about the you know culture communication between you know between the government and the ethnic people. So. Uh, so when I talk about the, uh, the situation of cultural communication in Myanmar, uh, I have to say that um, Myanmar, people in Myanmar don't actually understand the meaning of cultural communication and its effect in peace building process. You know, because, you know, when I research about the cultural communication uh, and uh, I, I have to interview with, you know, many ethnic people in ethnic regions, and when I talk about when I talk with them about you know, uh, culture communication, they they don't know what I really mean. So I change my questions like, you know, I change I ask them like, uh, what you guys you know wanna receive, uh, from the government after the peace conflict resolution and peace building process. Yeah, they all, at that time, they always mentioned about that, you know, they want that they are ethnic rights on culture, religion, and, you know, language, literature, and so on. It is also about the culture things, and they, the thing they want to get from the government is just a culture communication, but they don't, uh, they don't know how to describe what they want to receive. So, that's why I have to say that people, the policymakers and the participants, uh, especially the ethnic people, don't know about the gacha communication in Myanmar. Uh, so from that point, the poll, the, so the, the communication and the, the mutual understanding and the mutual trust, you know, has been lacking between the two groups. And and so, uh, from doing research uh, about the cultural communication and peace building process in Myanmar, I got uh, some, you know, possible experts to promote cultural communication in peace building process. So I would like to present some, you know, three possible aspects to encourage cultural communication in peace, uh, conflict resolution and peace building process in my in this presentation. The first one is the promotion of ethnic identity. So when I ask ethnic people about their identities, they always mention about their language because as there is no language, there is no identity. 
So ethnic people mainly talk about the promotion of ethnic languages. So we need to promote teaching and learning ethnic languages in every ethnic regions as a form of education. Actually, preservation of ethnic language is a beauty of diversity and also it is a promotion of ethnic identity. So like I always say, uh, diversity is a kind of beauty, not for suppression. So we need to think about the promotion of ethnic identity. And the, the second possible aspect is the adoption of multicultural policy. Uh, so accepting multicultural policy are a way forward to better peace building in cultural diverse society. Up, uh, up until now, in Myanmar, assimilation and marginalization approaches to peace is a total failure. So ethnic enclaves approaches can be adopted in some other uh, ethnic areas. So mutual trust and understanding can bring the easier negotiation for peace process and conflict resolution. So understanding multiculturalism and adoption of multicultural policy are better, uh, better solution for peace building and conflict resolution process. And the last one, the third, the last and the third possible aspect is a government effort on cultural communication and multiculturalism. Of course, we need the government effort to promote the cultural communication. Affirmative action by the government on cultural communication and multiculturalism for peace process can tell about the genuine mindset of the stakeholders in the peace process. In Myanmar, there is a Ministry of Ethnic Affairs, which is uh, responsible for all matters related to ethnic rights, tradition, culture, and norms. So far as a government policy, there has been establishment of mother tongue education as a part of promotion of ethnic identities by the government, which teach ethnic children from an education by using their ethnic languages uh, as a media language in teaching and learning not Burmese language. So, and the ethnic, the, the government stated the law of protection of national ethnicity rights. So we have to say that government effort can also shape the road to peace. That, you know, however, we, those effort um, is, is not enough for complete peace in the country, of course. So uh, um, also we are trying our best uh, because peace is a long journey with complicated twists and turns. So in Myanmar case, gacha communication is a good, is a good support to drive safe and fast to on the road to peace and that also you know gacha communication uh the promotion of gacha communication is also you know uh necessary in other multicultural societies so that's why i would like to you know focus the, what is the relation between gacha communication and peace in peace building process uh from um I, I hope uh, some, uh, you know, you guys can, can get some idea and perspective from my presentation. Uh, thank you for your listening. And uh, I have to say that, terima kasih. So I, I try so hard, you know, so for so many days. And I hope... Two people. You can address to any speaker except uh, Professor... Kotori who has left the forum because of the something and uh, for that you can address question to the other speakers you can address the question directly to them so, or if you would like to translations we would like to do for you oke okay, disilakan para bapak ibu yang ingin bertanya disilakan untuk dua orang ada pertanyaan? Ada pertanyaan? Silakan. <coughs> Mungkin apa karena dalam bahasa Arab kita ada penerjemah kalau bahasa Inggris pun saya akan terjemahkan tidak apa-apa. <coughs> Oke. Okay. 
The first question will be addressed by Dr. Mujahid. Yeah, welcome. Please. Uh, Thank you for the time. My questions. My question for Professor Oliver Sharbot and Professor Jorgen Nelson. Because both of you in Europe now, could you explain what the projections for the future of Muslim community or Muslim society in Europe for 20 years, next 20 years? Thank you. Okay, another one. The questions. The now, we have to say we take only Oliver is already with us. Must he connect? Recording in progress. Must he connect? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Nielsen, uh, one of our participants asked you the question concerning the condition, the prospects of Muslim immigration in Europe in the next 20 years. We welcome, uh, we appreciate your response. Yeah, and you want to start or shall I uh, go ahead first? Uh, well, well, I have a go, go and then you might be able to add uh, 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 other information uh, later on. Um, um, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question, what the question is referring to. I suppose there are, there are two aspects here. One is the kind of the, the, the demographic aspect and, and uh, the, uh, the, the demographic growth, growth um, um, of, of the Muslim population, Muslim population in Europe. And, and you know, it's very, you know, it's very clear that the number of Muslims, Muslims in Europe, in Europe Will increase, will increase significantly. significantly. I mean, there are happy projections, happy projections by, by organizations like the Pew Foundation, um, you know, putting, putting forward different different scenarios uh, about, about the growth of the Muslim, Muslim population. population. And, and we know that Islam, uh, its presence, you know, will be become stronger in, in terms of numbers, you know, within the next uh, um, uh, 50 years. The, the other, other aspect, aspect, I suppose, relates to the position of Islam and Muslims in European societies. And uh, Jörn obviously has, has talked about you know, different issues and trajectories here. I think what we can see um, are two um, interesting and apparently contradictory processes. On the one hand, um, what, what we are seeing, seeing although, although migration still plays a very important role in terms, in terms of the, the growth of the Muslim population uh, of, of Europe, Europe, but we see an increasing decoupling of the Muslim presence from migration, migration because we have now uh, the, the third generation, generation, the fourth generation of children or grandchildren or great grandchildren of the initial Muslim migrants, migrants in Europe. Europe. So, so these, these are people who uh, were, were born grew up educated and socialized in European societies. Uh, so we have you know, a very, very significant you know, presence of Muslims in European societies that um, are in that sense in social cultural terms fully integrated in, in European societies and of course have made their presence felt. I mean, they are not silent. There are... Uh, uh, you know, demanding the recognition of the religious and cultural needs of Muslims. They are politically involved. There are public figures in, in not just in politics, in business, in uh, in education, in um, entertainment, and so on. So there is also um, a stronger by, if you like, the children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren of initial um, Muslim migrants. Um, so there is, in, a, in that sense, a kind of a normalization of Islam in European societies and a normalization of this presence. In response, however, and again, Jörn has mentioned this in his paper as well, we see the rise of right-wing populism across many European countries. And, and one of the major targets of right-wing populism are uh, Muslims and the notion 
that you know Muslims uh, are not sufficiently integrated in European societies, that their religion contains values that are opposed to European values, you know, whatever um, they might be, or however they might be um, defined. Um, and I think that's going to be the challenge in the forthcoming decades. Uh, we have, on the one hand, a very well-integrated Muslim presence that um, normalizes the presence of Islam in European societies, that is a visible presence in all aspects of life, and at the same time, we have um, the rise of, of populist exclusionary discourses across Europe that target, in particular, um, Muslim minorities in Europe. Another question. Then we have to stop here because of the time constraint. And uh, for that, uh, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all the speakers and invited speakers and also the participants. I would like to have the keynote speakers from uh, Europe, from Oliver, uh, from uh, Nelson, that there are a few hundreds of people here in the hotel and there are a few hundreds of people online so we wish all that you could be here with us today but because of the law that we cannot negotiate so we uh, frankly speaking have to return the money to the state <laughs> yeah hopefully it doesn't happen but uh, it did and uh, for now uh, let's give a big applause to the success of our conference today And uh, finally, I'm Mustafa Ayal, so on behalf of the committee, we apologize for any convenience and we thank you for your presence, for your participation. For further information, please collect, please collect your uh, book abstracts. If you haven't got one, please contact the uh, organizing committee and you can come to see us any working days and working hours in our Persia Sarjana in Aramanasya. And finally, let us say Alhamdulillah. 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 Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. session will be shared in some rooms for participants. Please see your program book or ask uh, for the committee to see your session's location. And for the next session, we will have coffee breaks. And please enjoy our snacks outside of the rooms and enjoy coffee break. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.